the system. Right. So we are 1 p.m. for London now. Uh, as we are always on time, I am going to open. Oh, it's, oh it is 8 o'clock. Uh, uh. Yeah. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening for people at different countries and places. Uh, we started our Sunday culture talk in May 2020 as a, one of the consequences of pandemic. And since everybody has to stay at home, we uh, organized the event once a week to invite someone to share either uh, food or travel or inspiring people stories. There's a uh, Facebook group as well, uh, so we can share recording and some photos of the event, especially for those who miss the event or for those who's uh, too late or too early to join our interactive event. We have the honor to have Professor Wilma today to open our December event. Wilma is probably the most senior member in our group in terms of both age and achievement. Uh, he's, uh, he worked with NASA uh, for space programs, but he's also a world top leading scientist in the research of blood circulation so he tries to apply, that's my understanding, he applies mathematics and physics in blood circulation. Uh, Wilma's story is a miracle of education because he dropped out of high school a uh, long time ago and he was born into a cotton pickers family during America's Great Depression. If things were normal, I don't think Wilma will be um, a top leading uh, scientist of the world who received Cambridge University's Lifetime Achievement Award. But Wilma's journey, of course, is unbelievable. And so what we have, we want to try to do today is to tell Wilma's story, to have Wilma to tell his story, uh, 86 years story in one hour. So that's a huge challenge for you, <laughs> Wilma. <laughs> wow. um, in one hour. Yes. Uh, we also have Gary, who is in a very early member of our group. Uh, for those who attended uh, Kennedy Space Center event, uh, Disney Around the World event, or for those who enjoy the photos taken by Gary. Uh, Gary is over there with his um, world map as a background. Uh, he introduced Wilma to us in the group. So today we will have Wilma and Gary telling us an unbelievable life journey of Professor Wilma Nicholas in one hour. <laughs> well, are, we, are we ready? You ready? We're ready. I'm okay. ready. <laughs> okay. Okay, can you see the warmer screen? Yes, we can. Okay, my other computer wasn't working. I couldn't couldn't make it work. Okay, so here we go. Wilmer's gonna talk. So uh, I, I put this uh, talk together a couple of weeks ago and uh, I uh, will try to tell you and uh, the time we have, how I went from the uh, uh, picking cotton to being a professor of medicine. It, uh, it was not uh, that easy and it was not a actually not planned this way, but it's the way it happened. And after probably 60 or 70 years, uh, uh, friends of mine uh, uh, said I should I should write it down in a in a book. So 
So I finally did. It took me about two years to do it, but nevertheless, uh, I wrote a book of uh, part part of my life, not all of it. Uh, all of it is probably uh, would not be uh, uh, proper to put down in writing, but nevertheless, uh, I I I did, and this is the cover of the book, and it's on. Uh, on Amazon, so if anybody's really interested in reading the uh, most of the whole story, it's in this. It's in this book. Can you hear that? Yep. Okay. I I was born and and raised in uh, the northeastern corner of Mississippi, and I was born in 1934, and uh, in 19 51, I joined the U.S. Navy and left home. So, so I was there uh, for 17 years. And uh, the, the place I grew up is not very far from the Mississippi, Tennessee uh, state line. And if any of you saw the movie Walking Tall, it was made in that area, about that area, and the people there were called the State Line Mob, and they were gangsters, uh, uh, murderers, and and just really, really bad people. And uh, so the next, the next one shows a little bit more details. Uh, uh, part of the map of Mississippi, and it shows the area over to the right, the uh, uh, around the area between Tupelo, Mississippi, and Corinth, Mississippi, and that little area is uh, where the majority of my life was spent. And uh, I have uh, squares around other places close by where famous people came from. Columbus, Mississippi is the home of Tennessee Williams. Uh, Clarksdale, Mississippi is uh, part of the Blues Trail and it's on, uh, it's, it's the hometown of the famous uh, African-American actor, Morgan Freeman. And just below there is Cleveland, Mississippi. And that's where I went to undergraduate school at Delta State College. It was a college at that time, but now it's a university. And it's also where the blues was born, the blues music. Uh, so uh, any of you that are interested, uh, and music and know some of the origins of some of the music. Well, this is where the blues came from, was Cleveland, Mississippi. And just below there is Indianola. And I don't know if uh, any of you, uh, if you've heard uh, any blues music, you've probably heard of B.B. King. Yes. That's the hometown of B.B. King. And also there's a museum uh, in Indianola, a B.B. King Museum. So, so all three of those uh, places are on the Blues Trail. And if you ever, if you ever take a trip to that part of the world, it's worthwhile going to some of the places on the Blues Trail, from New Orleans to Memphis. So, when I grew up. Uh, I was born into a family of sharecroppers. Uh, my uh, parents, uh, my mother's family came from uh, Huntsville, Alabama in a covered wagon. And uh, they, they settled in that part of Mississippi. And my daddy's family came from Missouri and uh, my mother was born 
in 1900, and my daddy was born in uh, in 1897, and and they got married in 1914 when my mother was 14 years old, and so the only way they had to make a living was uh, sharecropping, and I, uh, if you don't know what a sharecropper is, it's similar to a migrant worker, except they don't move quite as often. My uh, mother had a, <clears throat> had a fourth grade education, and uh, my father went went uh, went through the third grade. However, sometimes he would say he was in the fourth grade. My mother said that he wasn't in the fourth grade. He just came in there to see her. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, nevertheless, they got married in uh, in 1914, and. Uh, had ten children, and by the by uh, by 1934, when I was born, my mother was 30, 34 years old, and she had ten children. At the, by by the time she was 34, I also one of my uncles lived uh, <clears throat> lived close by us. And uh, his name was Uncle Macon, and he had three boys and one girl. And and all of the uh, all of the boys learned to play string instruments like guitars, mandolins, fiddles. If it was a string instrument, they could play it, and they formed a band. And that uh, was called the Lee County Ramblers, and their their sister was uh, the vocalist of the group, and so they would play in Tupelo, uh, Mississippi, at the Tupelo Jamboree on uh, Saturday afternoon, and so once uh, on one occasion when they were playing. Uh, <clears throat> A young boy, about eight or nine years old, with a small guitar, uh, asked my uncle Macon if he could join the group. And so he told the little boy that the group was made up of family members and they really didn't need another guitar player. And <clears throat> later on, he... Uh, he told one of his sons that the reason he didn't want to have the boy play with him is because he thought he might embarrass the uh, the group. So go to the next. So Baldwin is uh, is where I grew up in oh, that oh. area, and oh, I. Cl Pardon? I was going to say, who was the uh, eight or nine year old boy? The eight or nine year old boy was Elvis Presley. <laughs> and, so you, your uncle rejected Elvis yeah. Presley. Good yeah. job. Well uh, done. Yeah. <laughs> and he, Elvis actually was born in Tupelo. And you can see I have that uh, square around that. <clears throat> and the area that he was born is where the. Uh, the jamboree used to be held. And he was born a year before me <clears throat> and we were in high school at the same time. And I didn't meet Elvis Presley at that time, but I would, uh, I knew girls that said they had dated Elvis, but I don't know if they had or not. But also there are two other places that I'd like to point out also is New Albany, Mississippi, <clears throat> is the hometown of the only Nobel Prize laureate from the state of Mississippi, and his name was William Faulkner. 
And if you look down on the lower corner, Pontotoc, I've uh, I've noted because if any of, any of you have heard the song "Midnight Train to Georgia," that's where the uh, author of that song came from, and he he wrote the song, and. Uh, and finally was able to get Gladys Knight and the Pips to sing the song. And they made it into a number one uh, hit on the, uh, the top 100. <clears throat> and his name is uh, Jim Weatherly. And he also played quarterback for the Ole Miss uh, football team. And uh, I never did meet him, but I did see him play football. And on the lower, the lower part is uh, is a picture of my mother and daddy, and we lived on several different parts out from <clears throat> Baldwin, Mississippi. And uh, Gary told me he said, "Well, those are misspelled." I said, "Well." I I can't help that because that's the way we talked back then. And the, the, the people in the South, especially the area where I grew up, they have their own language. And it's, it's due to the fact they learned it from their ancestors as they came down. And, uh, and Mississippi, <clears throat> in the summertime gets very, very hot and people get lazy. And they're also uh, lazy in their speech also. So they, they shorten words like Baldwin and Mississippi. It's not Mississippi, they say Mississippi. <coughs> but that's uh, uh, the, the wagon and team of uh, either horses or mules, I don't know which it is, but that's the only transportation that mom and daddy had at that time. And that's two of their, uh, that's the first two of their children. It's my sister, older sister, uh, Eva, and my older brother, Virgil. And out of out of the 10, children there's only three of us left and i'm the youngest of the three and my oldest brother who is who is living is 95 and my other brother uh who's two years older than i am he's 88. okay and this, uh, the top picture shows some of the Nichols children. <clears throat> and this was taken about 1939. And uh, the other three, my older brother, Virgil, had been uh, drafted uh, into the Navy. Uh, I don't know if you know about the draft, but it, it actually started before the war. And they had uh, the first draft, you only had to <clears throat> serve one year. And he was in the Navy, but the other two missing children <clears throat> died when they were young. Uh, my uh, sister, was I think 12 years old when she died um, and they didn't know why she died and the little boy got killed, he got shot. So uh, if, you, if you haven't been on a farm <clears throat> and worked on a farm, you don't know, you don't realize how difficult it is. The work <clears throat> is extremely uh, difficult. And uh, we worked uh, from sunup to sundown six days a week 
during harvest and har uh, preparation of the soil and harvest time and uh, from about middle of April until the middle of November. <clears throat> and all the work uh, was done by hand and either with, uh, with two horses <clears throat> or or two mules. It looks here like maybe they have one mule and one horse, but we never did work them together. And <clears throat> so we would drop out of school uh, about the middle of April. And, uh, and then we wouldn't go back until, until that fall. So we actually only went to school about six months out of the nine month uh, uh, school year. And when I was eight years old, uh, my uh, daddy one day told me, he said, if you pick more cotton than I do today, I'll give you a quarter. And you know, a quarter is 25 cents, of course. <clears throat> and so, so <clears throat> I told him I would make a deal with him that I would do that. I, I would accept the challenge if he would let me go home and stop picking cotton when I uh, picked 200 pounds. And that's, that's a, uh, <coughs> an unusually large amount of cotton for even for an adult. So he told me, okay, that he, <laughs> that he would do it. And so by about five o'clock, I had already picked 200 pounds, and I, there was no way he was going to pick more than more than 200 pounds that day. And so he gave me a quarter, and uh, so I left uh, to walk home. <clears throat> and uh, I walked by this uh, general store that was in the area that we used to where we used to shop, and. Uh, I stopped to buy to buy a, buy a sack of tobacco because I, I smoked back then also, and so I went by there and the uh, the gentleman who owned the store said I can't sell, I can't sell you tobacco you're too young. <clears throat> I said well I'm buying it from my older brother, and uh, he said which one and I said. <laughs> My my brother Virgil, he said, well, I know he's already gone to the Navy. So, so I said, well, just give me five pieces of bubble gum. <laughs> so, but nevertheless, that was a big mistake because after that, daddy expected me to pick at least 200 pounds of cotton every day. So, but anyhow, but yet, but, but my brother, who was, uh, two years older than me, and I'll tell you more about him as time goes by, but I could never pick more cotton than he could. He always picked more than me. <laughs> so, okay. So this is uh, similar to the house. It's not one I grew up in, but it's similar to the type of house I grew up in. <clears throat> they were always, they were wood houses, and uh, with no insulation and with a tin roof. And uh, they were usually three rooms or four rooms. And uh, they were unpainted. And, and those, each room it, uh, had two beds, except the room where the fireplace was. And if you see, see the chimney that's the only heat we had was a fireplace and so there was one bed in that room 
and that's the room that mom and daddy uh, uh, stayed in and slept in. And the other the other two rooms had two beds each, and from two to three people slept in those rooms. And I slept with mom and daddy until I was about five years old. And then I was kind of passed around to uh, different people. And uh, when I was about, I guess about 10 years old, me and my brother, uh, Bobby, who's two years older than me, he and I started sleeping together in the same bed. <clears throat> and we slept together until we went to the Navy. And every, every house, of course, we had no electricity <clears throat> or no plumbing. And uh, we, so therefore we had to have an outhouse. And I'm sure that all of you know what an outhouse is. And uh, most of them only had one hole, but we, we lived in one house that had two. And I don't know why uh, it had two, but uh, me and my brother used to use the, the, the two uh, holes at one time. And that's a, brother, that's a picture of my brother, Bobby. He was eight years old there. And uh, I was six years old in that picture with the long hair. You were so cute. And, uh, pardon? So cute. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I didn't have a haircut until I was uh, six years old. <clears throat> and uh, I, I, wa I was going to start the school that fall. And I, I told Mama that I wasn't going to school unless I had a haircut. And uh, I also told her, and I said, I'm not wearing a dress to school either. So, <laughs> so she took me, <laughs> took me and got, a, got, a, got me a haircut. <clears throat> but the year before that, uh, the, uh, the cotton crop we had was not that good that year. So daddy... I uh, heard of these uh, places in Arkansas that uh, that was hiring people to pick cotton. They their uh, cotton uh, was ready to pick about two weeks before ours. So <clears throat> so Daddy planned to take us to Lepanto, Arkansas. Uh, and 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 not the fall of 1939, and pick cotton because they they would uh, give you a place to stay and meals, and they would I think they were paying a a dollar for every hundred pounds of cotton you picked. <clears throat> and from where we lived in Mississippi to Lepanto was 173 miles. We lived in Gift, Mississippi at that time, which is not very far from Corinth. So daddy had had gotten enough money or some way had gotten an old, uh, an, uh, an A model car that looked like that one. And <clears throat> so we decided to head out for Arkansas and start picking cotton. And me and mom and daddy uh, sat in the front seat and my older brother and his wife in the back seat and my other two brothers, Alden and Ben, stood on the running board outside and we uh, drove all the way to, uh, to Lepanto, which is 173 miles. <clears throat> and mama, we got up real, real early that morning and mama uh, cooked, uh, uh, had cooked chicken the day before <clears throat> to take with us. And uh, we got up early so she could cook uh, some biscuits to also take for us to eat on the journey. <clears throat> and, uh, and that was carried in the back seat 
with my brother and his wife. So we we figured that if we left real early in the morning, we could get there uh, before dark because <clears throat> we would never stay on the road uh, uh, at night in a journey. If we had had to stay somewhere, we would have stopped and slept in the car. But nevertheless, we made it there uh, before dark and before supper, and we were really happy about that because we were all really, really tired and hungry. And uh, the next day <clears throat> uh, that we got there, everybody went to the cotton patch, including me. And uh, so I, I would pick and and put it in my mama's uh, sack. And uh, before we left Gift, I was playing out in the barnyard and I jumped off of, and I was barefooted and uh, I stuck a, uh, I jumped and there was a nail and a plank that I jumped on <clears throat> and it stuck all the way through my foot. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and uh and so my sister came and pulled it out with me yelling like crazy and uh then that night before we left the next morning my grandma who lived with us also uh soaked my foot in, in kerosene because that's what people did for injuries back then is put kerosene or soak so the or soak the wound in kerosene. But nevertheless, after <clears throat> after the second day, the next morning, I got up with a real, real high fever. I, I uh, so so I didn't go to the cotton patch that day, and my mother stayed home uh, with me. And about uh, late that morning, my fever got up to 106 degrees Fahrenheit. And the lady of the house said, you know, you really need to put that young one in, uh, in a tub of ice water. And, uh, and so, so they, uh, they filled a tub with ice water and, uh, and put me in it abruptly. And when they did, uh, my heart stopped, and the last the last thing I remember is <laughs> hearing my mother uh, screaming, and then ev everything went totally blank, and uh, so I I felt like I was walking on a cloud. And I, I could see people from the past that uh, that I that I'd never seen in 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 my life before. And so, after about fifteen minutes, uh, apparently, my heart started beating again, and I was in my mother's lap in a blanket and uh my fever had gone down to about 102 degrees and mama told me that uh it had been about 15 minutes uh since they put me in the bat in the uh, tub of ice water so apparently I died for about 15 minutes. So uh, when 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 uh, when I was uh, six and my brother Bobby was eight, we started the school together because he wouldn't start the school until I got old enough to go with him. So we started that year in 1940 to gift 
uh, to the school not far from Gift. It was called Kosciuszko, Mississippi. Okay. So that year after we finished picking cotton, which is about uh, uh, the middle of November, me and Bobby started the school at, at uh, it was at Gift, but the school was named Kosciuszko was named Kasuth, not Kosciuszko. The, the school was about five miles from my home, so <clears throat> so we had to catch a school bus. And uh, this uh, picture is a picture of my uh, brother, Hop. We called him Hop. His name was Jesse Braxton. <clears throat> and at the age of 19, uh, he had gotten married to uh, a really, really pretty girl. And they got married November the 23rd. And uh, so we were in school one day. We'd been going uh, to school for maybe a week or so. <clears throat> and somebody came to our room and said, uh, said we needed to go home. And... <clears throat> And there was uh, me and Bobby and two of my brothers and my sister <clears throat> were in school. And so we said, you know, why do we need to go, have to go home? And they, they wouldn't tell us. And uh, <laughs> so when we got home, uh, they told us that, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> Well, they, they told me Hop was dead. So, uh, so we didn't go back to school. <laughs> we didn't go back to school that year. So, uh, that that was the first first. Uh, time I dropped out of school. I dropped out of school several times, so I'll I'll tell you about a couple of them. But nevertheless, uh, <clears throat> that uh, uh, the next fall we moved to to another uh, farm, and it was uh, close to Baldwin, so we were going to have to go to. <laughs> to Baldwin High School. And uh, the we we had started again. Me and Bobby, and if you, if you see the lower picture, me and Bobby <clears throat> were in the first grade and we started again that year, which was 1941. We were still in the first grade and the name of the school was Frog Level. Okay, next. So after we finished, uh, uh, after we went to, through the uh, fourth grade, we finished the fourth grade and moved to, uh, to the place closer to town in 1944. And uh, we were going to uh, start school there. So me and Bobby uh, went to school and uh, We'd always worn overalls and brogan shoes as usual to school, so that's what we wore to school that day. And we were the only boys in the entire school dressed in, in uh, overalls and brogans. And uh, some some of the kids made fun of us. They call us plowboys and 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 cloud hoppers. So so we went what we went home that day and uh told mom and daddy we weren't going. We were not going to go to school. So uh, 
this was the second time that we had dropped out of school. So we skipped the 1945 and 1946 school year. And so the next year we did go back to school and uh, <clears throat> the first day in school, I saw the most beautiful girl <laughs> that I'd ever seen. And uh, her, her name was Mayor Tom Gordon. And so uh, I think that was one of the things that enticed me to go back to school the next day and, uh, and continue on because uh, I really, really fell in love with that uh, that little girl and so so we went to school and we were in the same class together until uh, the 10th grade so after we finished the 10th grade uh, in 1951 uh, we both dropped out of school and joined the Navy but Bobby joined the Navy a month or so before I did because he was going to be drafted uh, into the Army. And uh, so and to, to uh, get out of being drafted into the Army, he uh, joined the Navy. And I went, when he joined, I went down to join also with him <clears throat> and they said, you can't go because you're, you're too young. And I said, well, I'm 17. They said, where's your birth certificate? And, uh, I said, well, I'm really not. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, just 16, but I'll be 17 next month. And so the man told me, he said, well, you don't look like you could pass the physical. He said, come over here and uh, get on these scales. And so I did, and I only weighed 120 pounds. He said, son, said, said, you couldn't pass the physical because you have to weigh 130 pounds. So I knew that during that next month, I had to gain t at least 10 pounds so I could pass the physical. <clears throat> And so, uh, so I went back home and started eating everything I could find. And I talked daddy into buying a stalk of bananas for me to eat. So, so I ate a whole stalk of bananas in a month. And, uh, and I knew that if I didn't weigh 130 pounds, I was going to put some rocks in my pocket to do something <laughs> because I was going to weigh 130 pounds but anyhow I got down I had to go from uh, from Baldwin to Tupelo which is about 20 miles and uh, so I had to hitchhike Every, everywhere I went I had to hitchhike so, so I hitchhiked to Tupelo and uh, I went in and uh, the guy weighed me and I weighed 132 pounds and I was so happy because <laughs> I really, really missed my brother Bobby. And uh, <clears throat> so he gave me the papers for mom and daddy to, uh, to sign. And so I hitchhiked back to Baldwin and had them sign the papers. <clears throat> and then... Uh, I hitchhiked back to Tupelo uh, the next day, and uh, and they uh, uh, said that we had to go to Birmingham, Alabama, to uh, to be sworn in and to catch a train to San Diego, and uh, so so we. Uh, so, so I went to, I, I got on a train in, uh, in, in Birmingham 
after riding to there on a Greyhound bus. And my first day in San Diego, we had to, uh, to muster early in the morning, which was about a little after daylight. And uh, so we marched and went to class and several different things. And <clears throat> about five or five thirty, we came back to to the barracks. And uh, so I went and uh, asked the the chief commanding officer. I said, "What are we going to do now?" And so he said, "Son, said you are finished for the day." <laughs> I said, oh, my God, I said, I've, I've died and gone to heaven. I said, I said, it's still daylight, and, I'm, and I don't have to work. So, but anyhow, I'm probably getting, I got about, what, 15 more minutes? <laughs> yeah, I was going to interrupt. But my, but my first assignment was Iwakuni, Japan. And I loved it. I loved Japan. I loved the people. I loved their, their way of life. And, uh, and you can see why I loved it so much. Right. <laughs> so, so the next, the next one. Did you hear that? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, Wilmer, I need to speed you up. Uh, yeah. We, we, um, we, uh, we probably ought to jump over to where you received your, um, your uh, lifetime oh, achievement. Award. Okay. Well, while, while you're doing that, I, uh, uh, when I got out of the Navy, I was able to start school on the GI bill. And, uh, so I, I uh, got my BS degree in uh, mathematics uh, and physics, and then uh, you, you can go and, and switch to the other one. Oh, oh. <laughs> but I worked in the space industry for uh, about four years. Uh, I worked on the uh, uh, Freedom 7 flight, the first American in space. And then I also uh, worked in Houston at the Manned Spacecraft Center on the Apollo and the Gemini projects. And the next, you can go to the next one. And that, that was, I worked at the same time with the ladies, uh, the three ladies uh, from the movie Hidden Figures. And uh, the lady on the left, Catherine uh, Johnson, we were all there at NASA at the man at Cape Canaveral at the same time. And, uh, we were just in different buildings, but we were doing the same thing. We were both, uh, we were all, uh, in missile tracking the next one. But, uh, I got my pilot's license in 1964. <clears throat> and then entered the University of Alabama School of Medicine and graduated with a PhD in physiology and biophysics. And my mentor was the father of hemodynamics, Donald A. McDonald. But while I was there, after, after I graduated, I was hired on the faculty. And uh, I met uh, Christian Bernard, the first uh, who was the doctor who did the first human to human heart transplant in uh, 1967 and I met him in uh, 1970 okay next one and I spent two years in Holland I was uh, invited to Holland to the Institute of Medical Physics to <clears throat> to work on a project uh, they were working on uh, and uh, I had to to uh, perform uh, open heart surgery on uh, uh, in the research lab and then plant devices to measure pressure and flow. So I was then recruited to Johns Hopkins Hospital in 1972 and uh, remained there for two years. And then in 1974, I went to the University of Florida College of Medicine and retired after about 40 years. 
I did uh, uh, while I was at the University of Florida. <clears throat> I met uh, Dr. Robert Cade, who is the inventor of Gatorade, and I'm sure probably all of you guys have heard of Gatorade, right? Yep. And when when uh, when I was uh, there, I was also did a sabbatical <clears throat> in Sydney, Australia. And at St. Vincent's Hospital to study the heart and blood circulation of kangaroos. <clears throat> and that's me catching one of them. <laughs> and 2003, I uh, did a sabbatical in Cambridge, uh, uh, England. And, uh, and I really, really, really loved it. It was a dream come true for me to be... Uh, to be there and uh and that's king's college uh on the right hand side and then that's uh one of the main streets in cambridge on the left and the next uh uh well this was a trip that, <laughs> that gary and i took to mississippi and rode the blues trail so i don't want to spend much time with that but one of the places that we really, really enjoyed was going to Po Monkey's Juke Joint in uh, the Mississippi Delta. And there's another picture of it. And that's Po Monkey on the left. My two dear, dear friends uh, who are both uh, deceased now, Henry Outlaw and Henry Bradshaw. And we loved going to Po Monkey's. It was so much fun. A lot of, lot of excitement. But it was just a run down shack out in the middle of a cotton patch. Okay. That's called that's called a yeah. juke joint. Yeah. Like from from jute box, the only the the only music they had uh back then was uh a juke joint, uh, a juke box. So so individuals would have a, have people come over in their house and they'd they would play uh, music on a jukebox, and that's where the name came from, Juke Joint. And so the, the person lived there that uh, Paul Monkey lived in the house. But this is this is in 19, uh, 2019, I was invited back to Cambridge uh, to receive a Lifetime Achievement Award, and it was uh, presented at Queens College, and... and uh, I'm sure you, most of you have seen this college before. And uh, Manji spent some time there too, right? Uh, yeah, spent one year in Cambridge. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes, King's College, yes. Yeah. So this is a picture of me and Gary and my wife uh, who passed away last year. So... Let, let me let me yeah, tell this yeah, one. Yeah, you can take over now, Gary. Well, I'll just tell one story here. The um, when you look, I'm going to get back to the picture. You notice I'm in the black suit and a Harley uh, hat. Okay. On this next picture, um, Arlene took the picture with my camera. She was on the next bridge over, which was Silver Street uh, Bridge. And if you look right here. If you can see where where the cursor's moving around, that's yeah. me. That's me sitting on the bridge, <laughs> and that's and so I waved to Arlene. I told her now when I wave, then take the picture. <laughs> so, so, so that's the story on that one. Wilmer, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> so I was presented the Lifetime Achievement Award by Dr. John Cockcroft, <clears throat> who was the president of the artery society of europe and uh, this is him <coughs> uh, uh, presenting uh some things that i had done so you can just go through these gary okay, these, and that's <laughs> these are what john was presenting yeah <laughs> <laughs> So he was telling, uh, as we went through these slides, he was telling about each one of them. 
So that's uh, Best Man Gary at Ground Zero in Clarksdale, Mississippi. And it's a blues uh, joint that's owned by Morgan Freeman. Wow. Because that, that's where he came from. And Morgan Freeman created that bar to, to employ people. I see. Right, yeah. Yes, yes. To... So there's the, that was the last slide where they were presenting the Lifetime Achievement Award. There the award is presented. And then Wilmer got up and, and talked a bit about what, he, what, uh, what it meant to him. Wilmer, go ahead. So, so it was really, really an honor and, and an extremely, extremely big surprise when, uh, when I was uh, asked, especially <clears throat> to come to Cambridge to have it presented in, at Cambridge. And uh, it's uh, an event that I will never, never forget. So there's uh, a picture of my wife, Arlene, and I. Uh, we were married 56 years, and she passed away last year. This was taken at the banquet uh, uh, after the presentation. Was she was the same? She was studying with you as well when you were doing a PhD. She was doing a master degree as well. I remember. Yes. 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 yes now yes. let me let me tell one quick yeah, story. Yeah. Okay. 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 Because Wilmer probably knows what this story is going to be. When you uh, meet your wife, it's always an interesting time. And Wilmer met Arlene in a in an autopsy. She was on the other side of the table. And then after the autopsy, he called her up and, and she said, do I know you? And he said, uh, well, I was on the other side of the autopsy table. <laughs> so, so, uh, so we got married not, not too long after that. <laughs> That's how you met your wife. Right, That's yes. <laughs> This is at a celebrating at a bar <laughs> at at uh, Cambridge. And the also, other two, the other two people are researchers. Yeah, the one one of the things that uh, one of their objectives to have uh, for for of the societies to have young investigators uh, come and present their work there, and uh, these two individuals i think were from uh poland or someplace like that so mm -hmm. it's really really it's really really a great society and uh and it's so interesting to go and uh and be there and meet all the young uh people that's coming along in this field of uh, mm -hmm. hemodynamics that that we started many many years ago And Minji, Minji uh, it's 859 my time. And uh, this is the last slide. <laughs> Do you want to say anything about it? <laughs> well, this was uh, in uh, one of the plazas. In fact, right next to where the uh, main punting source, uh, punting on the cam. And uh, we were there with the uh, with a lot of Wilmer's old uh, uh, buddies that were um, world-class researchers. Wow. Well, I I, <clears throat> I hope you uh, the people enjoyed my presentation. I'm sorry that uh, every time I even read that book and proofread it, I get emotional. And uh, it's just something and I can't help. So well, that, I that adds, adds. No, no, that adds to it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just going to. Oh, OK, let me. Uh, Is it OK to stop sharing? The... Yes, uh, I'm going to uh, get out here. Yes. Um, I oh, think there we are. I, I'm sure uh, like. 
everybody else in the group, I'm struck by the story. We, many of us, we mentioned in the chat box, we want one more day with Wilma. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the journey is just unbelievable. So Wilma, was it last year you published the book, Life Remembered? Right. Um, yeah. The uh, Memories of a Sharecropper Person. It's available on Amazon in both Kindle formats. Yes. Hot copy. Right. When um, I... Kindle and... Hello? And it's coming soon. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. But I was saying the audio version is coming soon, Minji. Great. I I mean, having so much achievement in science and having the experience working with NASA is simply incredible. But what really touched me and I'm sure other people as well was when you share the stories of your family and early your, your your friendship with Bobby your brother and uh, the school experience and uh, growing up with nine other siblings um, many of us we don't have nine right, siblings yeah. so, um, you must have had so many sweet and cozy memories with oh god oh yeah them. yeah <laughs> There are many, many, many. Yes. Sorry. And uh, and you you can read you read some of them in the book. Of course, uh, if I had written down everything, I would never have finished. So I had to <laughs> I had to hit the highlights. <laughs> yes, we we wish to have one more day with you. Probably we can arrange another session with Wilma and Gary next year well well i have uh i have i went to have I had to have a checkup yesterday <clears throat> and i have a pacemaker implanted that i had to have implanted last year and the lady told me uh, yesterday